My name is uh, Dr. Dino Pappas. Uh, I'm on with uh, Dr. William Brady. He is the founder of uh, Integrative Diagnosis. That's a treatment system and a treatment methodology that involves a comprehensive and thorough assessment, uh, followed by dedicated and specific manual treatment, followed by clinical audit, um, have a, a baseline that you are checking, reassessing to make sure that not only pain is changing, but an objective baseline movement, tolerance to load and capacity. Um, the reason why I'm interviewing Dr. Brady is because uh, there's been a lot of myths and misconceptions about uh, integrative diagnosis on social media forums and in talking to other providers. And uh, I, I'm curious, I, I'd like to know a little bit more before casting a uh, opinion one way or another. So uh, doc, if you can take it away and give me a little bit about your background and uh, let's go from there. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, I want to start by thanking you for doing the interview. There was an exchange on a, on a Facebook group and people were looking for short answers to complicated questions. And I had volunteered to say, hey, I'd rather do this in a conversation and then we can share that. And thank you for taking me up on that. There were other people that were uh, not at all eager to, uh, to do this, but I appreciate the time invested here. So thank you. Uh, my background is I graduated Logan College of Chiropractic as valedictorian in 1998. And even before graduating, I had taken my first active release techniques seminar, which at the time was the state of the art soft tissue. And I remember taking my first seminar with Dr. Leahy and he was treating these structures and he was so specific with the anatomy. I was like, that's why we took gross anatomy to know all of the tissues. And this is a direct clinical application that's very specific. So I loved that. And I then went on to teach active release techniques for 10 years. And in that time frame, what I started to see was the lack of a diagnostic system. As good as it is, it's another technique. Meaning you get trained in it, you get certified, and then you do that thing to people. So if you were doing active release, you take a symptom pattern and you look at it and go, okay, I'm going to do these protocols. That is the ART patent. Now, what happens when you go, oh, well, I heard about this Graston thing. How do I then do that and ART? Or how do I do SFMA? Or how do I do McKenzie? Or take your pick. And looking back at school, I was like, you know what? That's true. Everybody is picking something. And the culture of school and chiropractic fosters this. We can all be friends. We're all right. It just take your pick, do the thing you'd like to do. And I began to realize that, no, there's an objective reality here that needs to be addressed. You don't choose what's wrong with your patient. You have to discover it. It's very different. Therefore, if the diagnosis isn't a choice but a discovery, treatment also shouldn't be a choice. There should be an objective thing that this patient needs that will work the best. And to me, that's the holy grail in all of medicine is a specific actionable diagnosis and then efficacious, safe and durable treatment. So that is what I am doing with integrative diagnosis. And that's part of the hard part with the myths and the communication is people instantly want to put it in a technique box. And, and it isn't that at all. It is a soup to nuts complete program for clinical excellence. So that's where I've come from. And that's the short story on, on how ID has come into existence. So you found out pretty early that one of the most common things that we find in chiropractic school that's lacking is a, an assessment, a comprehensive, thorough assessment. Rather than throw stuff up against the wall and hoping it sticks, and namely in chiropractic, that's the manipulation, maybe a little tissue work, uh, you found out pretty early that the assessment was key and critical as to dictating what treatment and what patient received what treatment. That's kind of how this all started, right? Absolutely the case. Absolutely. Um, when, when you talk about assessment, what things, what specific things are you looking for? Is it like a checklist in your mind that you go through that process? Is it, all right, let's let the history take us and wherever this is going to go, a little combination of both, or how do you assess uh, a patient? How do you classify a patient as to what their needs are? Yeah, that's a huge question, right? And we could spend a lot of time on right it. Right off I'll, the bat, I'll, man. Right. No, and I, I love it. And it's a great question. I will do my best to answer it in a short environment because this there's I always run the risk of people either thinking, well, I already do it that way 
or that's way too complicated, right? So there's the, there's the bookends to this. So the, what we do is all of this. I just finished a webinar on integrating the history taking. And what we've done in ID is, and I've done, I coach. So I do one-on-one -on -one calls with guys and I do this to 10 hours a week and we go through their difficult cases. And what I've pulled out from the last three or four years of this is there's seven things in the history you absolutely have to know and interpret. So that's, then this is gonna sound normal. This is age, sex, symptom, location, quality, intensity, provocative and palliative. But what we do with that is think in a tissue and pathology specific way. So when I take the history, I'm going, okay, what's loaded in that provocative position? What's unloaded in that palliative position? So it's not a shortcut where you go, oh, pain with sitting equals disc. It's what are all the tissues that are loaded in this provocative position? And what are tissues that are unloaded in this palliative position? And then what tissues and pathologies would refer a symptom in this symptom pattern? or what local tissue would cause a problem in this symptom pattern in a patient who's this age. So we go deep and specific with tissue and pathology in mind. So we're asking the same questions, but with a very different perspective. And at the end of the history, we have what we call a diagnostic hypothesis. And it's a list of tissue and pathology specific problems. Do I think this is osteoarthritis of the hip? Do I think this is a lumbar internal disc derangement? Do I think this is adhesion between the sciatic nerve and the external rotator? Or am I trying to decide between three of those? I wanna go into my exam already with an idea of what I wanna rule in or out. So that's just the short answer to how do we approach the history? So specific answers to specific problems, guiding you to work on uh, specific tissues is what it sounds like. And in your mind, trying to figure out what's the priority and what should be put on the back burner. Uh, that's that's kind of what I got from that statement. Is that fair assessment uh, and, and on that? Yes, it is. So it's it's trying to figure out what's signal and what's noise. You know, if you just take a history the way we're taught in school, you ask this OPP, QRST, and all of this information, but you're not processing it. You're not using right. it. You just kind of do the history and then go, okay, time to see if my technique's going to work. Right. So we slow the whole thing down and say the history has a purpose. Once it serves its purpose, we can then begin the exam. I remember what you said from a, a, a video. Uh, I had the, uh, the the chance to watch a couple of the the videos that you posted, and um, transitioning into the second part, the assessment, and the third part treatment. You have in your back of your mind your differential list, what you're working with. But when you start to get into the palpatory and assessment spot, that that transitions a little bit. You almost uh, put the uh, history on the back burner. Did uh, did I hear that correctly in a video? What do you mean by that? Yeah, right. Good question. So there's this duality between going into your examination with an idea as to what's wrong, but also gathering objective information. So if I think I'm going to find an adhesion between the sciatic nerve and the external rotators, and I go to palpate that with that in mind, I am actually might corrupt my own data a little bit. So I'm Self -fulfilling always fulfilling prophecy to, to a certain degree. You got it right. So we need to avoid that error to be one person and still be objective. So I have this very Zen concept that I like to teach that when it's time to think, think when it's time to do, do. So when I'm palpating, I am not thinking about what should be here. I'm simply collecting feedback about what is here. And then when I'm done palpating, I'll go back into thought and integration mode. But you've got to be able to switch gears from, you know, if, same thing. If I'm measuring a straight leg raise, I'm just going to measure that. That is just a data point. Then I get to integrate that. What does it mean? But I can't crosstalk those two or, you know, or my objectivity is sacrificed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, it makes a little more sense hearing that explanation. I was a little confused because... Maybe that's a standard way you train, but I understand that expectation could create that reality. And sometimes your objective exam is different than what your subject is leading you to. And that's some of the challenging things in medicine is patients are not textbook. Now everything stacks, stacks up. The physicist Feynman said something about fooling yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. So we want to make oh. sure we don't do that. 
We've seen a, a pushback in modern musculoskeletal medicine um, with regards to uh, pain generating tissues. In other words, uh, some of the literature is suggesting that we don't know the exact source of pain. Um, we should look at motions, positions, loading capacities, intolerance, uh, the extension intolerant back, the flexion intolerant back. Um, I know that the system from the outside looking in is very tissue specific, um, and it seems like it's pain generating specific. Is there, uh, is there, do you find a little bit of a disconnect between what we're, we're, we're moving towards and what the past was and what the system is and morphing into at all? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, so yes, I see a discrepancy between the two. I don't think I'd call it a disconnect. I think what happens is, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, but care and training for musculoskeletal conditions is nonspecific. So for instance, I read a, an article on a meta-analysis or uh of McKenzie protocols. And what they did was they said, well, everybody that has acute low back pain, we're going to do normal treatment and then add McKenzie. And they basically found it doesn't make a difference because you did it to everybody. You didn't do it to the people that would have that problem that it would respond to. So yeah, basically the research in musculoskeletal medicine demonstrates that giving them an educational pamphlet is no different than any treatment. So I see how the providers and the public and the payers are all frustrated with the result. So then they try to go, well, if none of these things work, what is happening? And we get into that pain science model or away from a specific diagnosis. And I think that's leaving that path too soon. You can get a tissue and pathology specific diagnosis in a clinical setting and then efficacious treatment based on that. It's just not commonly done. So I think the disconnect is we're not good enough at it. It's not to abandon the principle that identifying the dysfunctional and painful tissue is important, but to double down on the principle and actually have the tools and skills necessary to accomplish that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dif different, a little bit of a different mindset. And uh, I've got uh, some interesting thoughts on the pain science crowd uh, nowadays. Uh, not that I, dislike them. I think they're very valuable, but I think they jump to that conclusion that everything is PNE, pain neuroscience education, a little too soon myself, to be honest with you. And you see some of the experts in the field like, um, you know, Stu McGill and stuff with, uh, you know, biomedically trained, biomechanist at heart, pushing back a little bit on that saying, whoa, 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 time out, slow down. There is something else to this, especially if that peripheral uh, nociception is driving that uh, subjective experience of pain, you need to figure out ways and strategies around that issue. So yeah, I, I hear that a little bit, a uh, little bit there too. Yeah. And I just want to do a quick comment there. I couldn't agree more. Yanda himself said that anything sensory motor cannot even be assessed until the peripheral tissue is clean because you get the peripheral nociceptive input, the peripheral mechanoreceptive input, if that's appropriately faulty because of dysfunction or damage, then you will get altered motor programs and altered pain states. But I agree with you. The idea that this is that chronic pain is automatically or even often an absence of tissue pathology. And their, their crux of their issue plays into your prior question is they say, well, there's no identifiable tissue pathology. And I'd say, true, if you aren't good at identifying it. And if you haven't been trained to identify it, then you'll miss it. And I think that's that's a longer conversation, but I think that, yeah, that's but I, th I think the pendulum is swinging that way because people are so frustrated. And again, you need to double yeah. down on the diagnosis, not abandon the diagnosis concept entirely. So how does ID classify patients? Um, one of my training, as you mentioned before, is I, I am McKenzie trained uh, formally. Uh, I'm certified. Um, I do read the articles that come on out. Um, it's not extensively what I do. There's a myth and misconception with McKenzie. Sure. I'm also uh, really reading uh, some of the, 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 the pain stuff that's been produced at the Rehab Institute of Chicago on uh, pain management classification um, you know, whether this is pain essentially mediated, autonomically mediated, whether it's nociceptive, 
how does ID go about classifying patients, putting them into categories to treatment match, match the most appropriate treatment to that patient, whether it would be exercise, manual therapy, uh, advice? How does ID go about classifying patients? A perfect uh, segue here. So what we do is, and it's going to sound uh, straightforward, but the devil's in the details, is those are the three buckets we pull from. And this is the basic training in ID is you have your manual therapy, you've got your exercise and you have your advice or load management is what we generally call it. What are the things you should do or shouldn't do with this given diagnosis? So the question becomes, how do we tailor that? And it's to the exact individual patient. We have a group of one right in front of us. So I'm not trying to stratify a population into different things. I am taking an individual patient in front of me. I know their symptoms. I know their provocative. I know their diagnosis. I know their load. And I know what to modify accordingly. So the subgrouping is extremely small because it's just what's wrong with this patient, tissue and and pathology, prioritized. So then we can say, if you have this tissue in this pathology, does that respond to conservative care? If so, what methods would I begin to reduce that with? If it's what we call an irreducible block, which wouldn't improve with conservative care, then we load manage it. And load management is external load. What choices do you make in your environment? And then getting your body to function better so that there's less load on a given tissue. So it's not subgrouping it in the in a broad sense of we've got three different types of people here or that sort of thing. Or, and you see this in the research where, well, you have acute pain and you have chronic pain. It's a bit of an artificial distinction. So we go straight to the patient details and build from that and manage and treat from that. Um, and I hope that doesn't sound like a trite answer, but it's what we're actually doing instead of stratifying populations, it's individual. This is why so much of the research doesn't work. There's no respect for the individual. Uh, yeah, some of the research tries to cast a, a, a broad brush, and some of the, the details uh, in the design just don't match up with actual clinical practice. Yes. And that's why, you know, people that read abstracts all day, uh, they can be fooled very easily because really the key sections of, of the article are the methodology sections. Yes. Um, and outside the methodology section is what are, their, what are the researchers' biases? Um, I read a, a, an article about uh, fibromyalgia the other day because my wife does functional medicine. And sure enough, the, the how to classify a fibromyalgia patient was changed. And of all the major ar- authors on the article, they had all had taken money from the pharmaceutical company. So, <laughs> right? you know, I don't know if necessarily those guidelines are the most appropriate, um, how to, how to diagnose a patient with fibromyalgia. So methodology is important. Uh, biases are important and then, and then get into, okay, what, what is the, the data say? And then finally, what are the conclusions? But we read the conclusions first because we want that little nugget. So you got it. We want the sound, but I couldn't agree more. And I want to yeah, add one good. thing to that is that clinical practice is informed by research. But research isn't clinical practice, and I'm sure you and I would agree on this, but it just needs to be said that because people, this is one of the things people ask, what research do you have in ID? And I say it's a program for clinical excellence. It's informed and guided by research, but it's the job of research to keep all of your variables the same except for the experimental variable. What's the one thing we're going to do different? It's the job of clinical practice to survey all of the variables, determine which ones are important and then proceed to correct those. So they're opposites. So people think that, oh, well, you must have research. Uh, If I were to research a patient, it would be an individual patient. And that's that's the most diametrically opposed way to look at it. I mean, again, I can go through examples because it was one of the things people asked, how do you use research in ID? And I use it all the time. I've got large sections on the website dedicated to it. Most of my presentations are indeed based on research. As a brief example, contributions of hamstring stiffness to straight leg raise and sit and reach test scores. And the authors, if I can jump to the conclusion here, uh, the present findings suggest that straight leg raise and sit and reach are strongly influenced by factors other than hamstring stiffness. 
So the hamstring doesn't block a straight leg raise. It doesn't block a sit and reach. And straight leg raise is one of the things we test. So what is happening? We find most often it's blocked by sciatic nerve entrapment. So clinically, neural tension, neural tension, lack of core. That's where my money, lack of core stability, uh, neural tension, and very seldomly I would say that it's actually uh, true hamstring pathology. Like you've got a uh, either adhesion. Uh, some people call it adhesion. Some people call it tissue extensibility dysfunction. The McKenzie people call it dysfunction of the tissue where it requires frequent adaptation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bored with that assessment there. So I, and I can cite five more of those to show what we do. So and I would even parse out some of those details where if different techniques are calling it different things, we would have to get to what is it, not just what is it classified as in a given system. There has to be an objective reality. So we do straight leg raise testing and we look at we measure the range. We look at your symptom quality, location, and intensity. And if it's less than 90 degrees, we add Braggard's test for the neural component. Mm -hmm. And if that increases the symptom or creates a new symptom, we have to manage that. And our list for the top things that are blocking straight leg raise, if Braggard's is positive, it's sciatic nerve entrapment at the hip or the hamstring or space occupying lesion involving a nerve root. Those are the two, those are the big things if Braggard's is positive. If Braggard's is negative, then we can go straight to palpation of the hamstring. But we don't use the test alone to establish a diagnosis. It's got to be reverse compatible with the history and the other exam findings. So there's a lot of details on that, but I, you can see how this isn't a technique-specific thing. There should be an objective reality as to what limits a straight leg raise. Yeah, and that's you mentioned that uh, in the initial intro, doing the ART protocols or the Graston training initially it was just conceived. It was you just do a bunch of stuff to the hamstring, and then the patient walk out the door. Are they better? Yes or no? Without you know the clinical audit, did your marker change? And uh, musculoskeletal medicine has been guilty, guilty, guilty of that a long time. Is how are we justifying the expense of you know billions of dollars of in failed treatment, billions of dollars in imaging, billions of dollars of uh, unnecessary uh, other procedures done because we have not been good enough at justifying our results or seeing an immediate result. So if we're dealing with the nervous system, the nervous system changes like that for the most part, can change like that and select musculoskeletal conditions. And we, we can't find something quickly. What are we doing? You know? I have, right. I couldn't agree more. To, to justify what we're doing, is extremely important. We look at, and I use this analogy in teaching, we look at your range of motion as your first metric of function, and we look at that as your blood pressure. You don't wait till someone's dizzy or rely on their symptom when you manage their blood pressure meds. You have a hard concrete measurement. What blood pressure is, is a measurement of load on the cardiovascular system. Diminished range is a measure of load on the musculoskeletal system. So we've established basic functional exam procedures in normal ranges that you have to have to be healthy. You may not have a symptom, but most of our patients do. They're the ones who are willing to part with time and money. So you come in with a symptom and we do the functional examination to see where the load is on your system. And this is your blood pressure for your musculoskeletal system. And we need it. I completely agree. We can't rely on like with ART. Well, what's your symptom? How do you feel? That's way too subjective to be spending billions yeah. of dollars on. Um, well, let's get into a little bit more of the uh, the coursework here. So take me through. I, I've not attended an ID course. Um, I have uh, shadowed uh, doctors that, that, that utilize the, the system that uh, you, you've developed. Take me through. What, what would an ID course constitute? What, what are we looking for? What, what, would, uh, what would a weekend uh, be like? Sure. So it's, it's a little bigger than a weekend in that it's a, it's a training program. And the first step in the program is the online process. So with all of the technology we have today, I mean, we've got hundreds and hundreds of hours of videos. We don't need to be in the same room. You don't need to fly anywhere to learn the concepts. So you, you get the online subscription at whatever level you'd like. And you learn that material. And the idea is you've actually had to learn it, be exposed to it, and be ready for the seminar. 
So after you've taken the online portions, you then take, there's body region specific 12 hour weekend courses. So we've got hip and lumbar, shoulder and knee, cervical and thoracic, ankle, elbow and wrist, and then an instrument seminar. And those are 90% hands-on. So you show up and we are gonna exactly match the tests and treatments that are in that portion of the online program. So when you show up for the live seminar, it's 30 to 60 minutes of sort of intro and reminders and then we're practicing the tests, recording those tests, practicing the procedures. Um, so it's all hands-on, it's testing and treatment. And most of the treatment in the system is geared toward diagnosis and treatment of adhesion. We find it's the most common, most underdiagnosed, and with expert care, the most correctable problem that limited limits ranges, causes pain, so we focus on that, on the treatment end in the seminars, because the other things like load management and exercises, you can learn that reasonably well from a video setting. We don't have to be in the same room. We do have to be in the same room to learn touch and feel and technique. Gotcha. Um, the, uh, the difference between, in your opinion, between the manual and the instrument, what have you found works best for different conditions? What uh, advantage, ad advantages are there for the manual versus the instrument? Because uh, there's a little bit of variation out there. And the, the saying goes, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. Yes. If you have your hands and everything's ART, all right, versus the, the instrument. What, what, do you, what do you find with that? A great question, right? And I get a great story to go with this. I was an ART instructor and David Graston had one of his SASTM seminars in Boston. And I was like, you know what? I'll just go. It's right down the street. It just happened to be convenient. And I was using those instruments and I was like, wow, this is a whole different level of feel. But what happened was he said, use these instruments on the whole body. And then Mike Leahy is saying, use ART on the whole body. You have this very uh, this pretty Polar strong, opposite. yeah, this pretty yeah. strong fight. And I said, well, I should be able to figure out when, when can I use either? When is one best? And in ART, what was immediately obvious to me was treating plantar fascia in some of the forearm extensors was just very hard on your thumbs and they're kind of the wrong shape. So the instrument worked really well there. Years later, we established rules for when do you use manual and instrument, which is the root of your question. And that is you can use an instrument, again, both for the diagnosis of adhesion. So we can get into tendinosis and some other things, but both of those are for diagnosis of adhesion. You use an instrument when it's an inch deep or less. You use your hands when it's an inch deep or greater is the first checkpoint. The second one is if it's less than an inch deep, if there's superficial structures, they have to be parallel. If you have a non-parallel superficial structure, the instrument will just flip over the superficial structure. So those are the first two rules. The third one is you can't have anything else in the way, any other anatomy, blood vessels, lymph, uh, cutaneous tissue. For example, in the hamstring, instrument work is largely ineffective because the fat in the posterior and medial thigh is more lobulated and all you do is grate through the fat. So we literally have a checklist conceptually and then we train here, don't ever use your thumbs, just use the instrument. Here, don't use the instrument, use your thumbs. Here, for instance, uh, flexor digitorum profundus, you can get most of it with your thumbs I'm sorry, with the instrument in the last third or so, the deepest portion, you'll need to use your thumbs to get to it. And I haven't seen that separated out anywhere else in such a straightforward, learnable way that produces the results. So you'll get better results with an instrument following these rules and better results with your hands and do a lot less work when you're using the instrument. So there's uh, a lot of uh, instruments on the market uh, right now, design, one's better than the other, cost. Uh, it's kind of like buying a car. Right. Uh, is there a preference as to style uh, utilization for you out there? I, I, uh, I'm not aware if uh, ID has its own uh, instrument that's been designed. So yep. can, you, can you speak to that, what, what you found best in terms of instrument design and utilization? 
Yes. So I did design my own instrument and we prototyped these based on those principles as to what would work best. Um, and we, so we use our own instruments called instrument adhesion release. Um, so that's what we recommend and that's what we use. And I've had a lot of guys who've had Graston and SASTM and ASTYM and, you know, take your pick. And if you haven't designed your instrument based on those fundamental principles I just laid out, it's not going to work. So in that we prototyped this like crazy. I've got a drawer full of ones made out of titanium, stainless steel, plastic, composites, different edges. And what we found, interestingly, was that what worked the best was very simple. And for instance, right, so David Graston made the first set of Graston instruments thinking he would match the shape of the instrument to the shape of the body. It sounds reasonable, but in application, if I have a curved instrument and a curved body part and they don't exactly match, I'm going to get a high point of tension in the middle and miss a lot of other stuff. So I thought about a razor. What does Gillette do when they sell you a razor? It's short and it's flat and the body adjusts to it. If they could sell you six different razors for the shape of your face, they would. They would. <laughs> so we have a very simple thing. The back is flat and the front has a gradual point. And we find that with that shape, we can get everything we need. And then with the edge, it's a radius curve. It's just sharp enough to catch the adhesion without damaging the cutaneous tissue. If it's too sharp, you damage the cutaneous tissue. If it's too blunt, you don't catch the adhesion. So we dialed this in and purpose built it. And the feedback we get from everyone that had used other instruments prior is that this produces a better result. Because again, in the system, our result is always a measurable change in range. It is uh, often debated I got to get into this. Sorry about this. Often debated is the adhesion concept. Um, we know, I, I, I'm of the opinion that it's, it is a definitely a clinical entity. Uh, it definitely, uh, and not just in post-surgical situations, the slam dunk, post-traumatic situations, but it can occur from a uh, routine and repetitive overuse situation, which is far more common and far more likely. The point of which I think the debate is centered now is, is the adhesion, is it a clinical entity to treat? What consistency do we have and reliability in palpating, uh, palpating, which is the primary method? And what is the implication? Is it a source of pain? Do we leave it alone? Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on this concept of, uh, of the adhesion, both, uh, you know, the the, the adhesion uh, deniers, like the climate change people, you got the climate change deniers yeah, yep. and you got the climate yep. change supporters and the, very seldom leaves. It's, it's a rational opinion right in the middle. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a huge thing. I think this again gets back to our training, but as to why people would believe one way and not another, there's some sort of motivated belief. If you haven't treated adhesion and you're a professional and you're like, oh, my God, the thought that that exists and I've been missing it is horrifying. You may lean against it because it violates your personal experience. And I respect that. Uh, but there is a ton of data on adhesion. There's a condition called deep gluteal nerve syndrome is what the surgeons call it. What it is is adhesion between the sciatic nerve and the external rotators, deep to the glute max, so they call it deep gluteal nerve. There is excellent publicly available research case studies where he took these people from a pain level of around seven to around two. They went from using opioids to not. They used the hip uh, disability questionnaire and dramatically improved them. So all of that's great and that's a nice case series, but what he did that's super interesting is he took the arthroscopic video and it's posted online. You can watch him stick a camera in there and you can see him identify the adhesion and see him cut the adhesion. I don't think anybody can watch that video and say adhesion doesn't exist and doesn't glue things together. So that level where people used to go, adhesion doesn't exist, the science completely disagrees with them. So that's the first step. Then the next step that people usually have is, well, it takes 2,000 pounds to break or something, it's as strong as steel, or those other comments. And those people are confusing strength of collagen research with strength of adhesion research. 
no one's going to say that collagen makes up both of those, right? Your, your Achilles tendon, your IT band and adhesion. But there's different densities, cross-sectional areas, fiber orientation that make this, sure, the substrate's the same, but it's very, very different. So adhesion exists, it glues things together, surgeons find it, cut it, and their patients get better. That is not a secret. In fact, I was recently on a podcast with some pain science guys, and a surgeon, a peripheral neurosurgeon in Las Vegas had contacted me after and was like, I can't believe pain science exists. He said, we see so much peripheral nerve entrapment and we're constantly cutting it. And this is, in, in his terms, the answer for chronic pain, or it has to be considered this until it's ruled out. And that's the surgeon's perspective. And that marries really well with mine. And him and I exchanged emails and discussed this, that we were worried about the pain science and and adhesion when not diagnosed, it's, it's dangerous. So I don't know if I got to all of your question there. I want to make sure I did that. There's good science to show that this exists. Um, what's lacking is to show conservative care of it. So we are actually implementing my top four guys are going to do a multi-center case series involving deep gluteal nerve syndrome, the same thing this surgeon treated. We're going to use similar inclusion criteria. We're going to measure straight leg raise, pain levels, and hip questionnaire. And we're going to take 40 to 100 cases through all four of these clinics and publish that data. So that's my number one goal for 2018 is to get that data wrapped up and get that submitted. Um, so that's in the future. Um, as far as palpation and identifying adhesion, it's a super important skill. And you have to be in the same room with an expert to really learn that skill. It's very refined. You know, I'd be tempted to say, I wouldn't believe you could play piano, that somebody could manage 88 keys and two or three pedals and get this in exact timing to make music. That sounds absurd until you see someone do it. And I would agree that palpation of adhesion to a lay person sounds absurd until you see somebody make music with it, until you see somebody identify it, break it down. And it's not just palpation in a vacuum. It's a measurable improvement in the range test, a decrease in their symptoms. So there's robust data of which a big piece is palpation. Our rule is you have to palpate the adhesion before you treat it. The same way a surgeon's rule is, if you can't name it, you can't cut it. We hold ourselves to that standard. Agree or disagree that most of the, the benefit of the, uh, the treatment of, uh, of adhesion, especially the immediate benefit, is neurological rather than the physical property of the tissue? Hmm. So I, would, uh, I don't know if it's agree or disagree, but here's what, what we teach is that the adhesion is reduced in real time, as you said earlier, that you should be able to get. And I always want some measure of immediate change, because if I didn't change it right now, it's not going to change two hours from now. So reduction of adhesion will create less adhesion, less resistance to motion in a better range. This is when the person gets up and they're like, ooh, that's lighter, that's freer. And we measure it and we've added five degrees, say, OK, cool. Now, that's one measure of response. Anytime you're touching somebody, you're triggering mechanoreception and a bunch of other things. So we have a piece of the response that is due to the adhesion breaking down and another piece that's what we call reflexive. Just getting in there and stimulating different things and getting a temporary response. So if your straight leg raise is 60 degrees and I break down adhesion and then it goes to 75 degrees, Maybe 10 of that is due to the adhesion breaking down and five degrees is due to the reflex change. So when you come in at the beginning of next visit, you may in fact be down to 70 instead of 75. So we train in the observation and assessment of a reflex change on top of the actual tissue change. So I'd gotcha. say it's both inescapably, but we aim to have the majority be the tissue change, not the reflex yeah, change. I know I know there's neurological and, and mechanical, and 
I've, you know, read some of that literature and it seems like, you know, this is like a conversation similar to stretching where a patient will stretch, 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 and any benefit of stretching is uh, gone soon thereafter because yes. that's the neurological, neurological tissue tolerance at play. And then if you permanently want to deform the tissue, the dose of which you have to load that tissue has to be so high and repeated over and over and over again to actually make mechanical deformation, kind of like braces. You lock in, you get tissue creep because of routine, extensive, repetitive loading. It's just hard to it's hard to conceptualize that the mechanical aspect supersedes the neurological aspect. That's uh, I just have tr- I struggle with that concept. I know it does occur, but it's just um, maybe maybe the mechanical aspect is different because when you actually have a tissue that's um, stationary, sedentary, it cannot exchange nutrients. That that initial rush besides the neurological is metabolic more than actually mechanical, the influx of blood flow and nutrients into that tissue. That's, that's where I get hung up at least. And it's a conversation in my mind. <laughs> okay. No, it was just totally so, fair. So let me paint this picture. So, cause I don't want to confuse research on stretching with adhesion. So I agree that stretching has to be done in an insane amount. We're talking 40 minutes a day for six weeks straight to get, you know, healthy tissue to be more extensible. But when yeah, we talk about mechanical benefit of that yeah yeah right which so i mean again the idea that a straight leg raise is even stretching a muscle is wrong it's protective tension or some other pathology but if you look at the reduction of adhesion improving a range of motion it isn't done by stretching or that kind of mechanical effect it's that you've got tissues that need to slide past one another and the adhesion is sticking them together and when you break that adhesion those tissues are free to move So in the straight leg raise example, when you go from flat on the table to 90 degrees straight leg raise, your sciatic nerve has to move about an inch and a quarter. Well, if you glue that down with adhesion, as you go through the range, it starts to stretch. The range range gets harder, may start to produce a symptom, and then you stop early. If I get on that adhesion, apply tensile force to it and physically reduce it, the nerve is no longer restricted. The nerve can floss through and your range improves. So it's a direct result of breaking down an abnormal connective tissue bridge, the adhesion, that results in the improved range. And it's most dramatic with nerve entrapments. So when people do nonspecific manual therapy and don't get a sustainable change in motion, because they haven't effectively applied enough tension to break down or haven't even diagnosed the presence of adhesion, they're just rubbing things more like a relaxation massage would. Yeah, it's more like a, a massage than actual specific manual therapy, which yeah, I I do agree. Um, let me let me move on. Uh, a couple other questions here. Appreciate your time here. Um, myths and misconceptions of ID. We saw them on social media. That's kind of what started this trend. What are the biggest myths and misconceptions of ID? Well, that's a long list, um, and it depends on top, the per- top three, top right? Three. Right. So, fair enough, right? Depends on the person you're talking to. So, I'd say myth number one is that adhesion isn't real, or if it is, it's not important, because that's what we spend a lot of time doing. That's where we get a lot of our results. I would say myth number two is people think it's a technique, so they're trying to immediately put it into a technique thing, and it's just it's. It's not. It's a complete program that uses all of the clinical pieces to do that. Um, so there's there's the top two as far as misconceptions about what it is. If there's a third, I'd say of the people that see it, that maybe sign up for the online program but never attend a live seminar, they can be overwhelmed. If your background is pick a technique and repeat these couple of things all day, it is a lot of work. And there's a lot of failure that everyone has to go through on their path to success. So I'd say number three is that people have that have seen it from the inside just think it's way too hard. Um, and it's complicated. Clinical excellence is complicated, but the tools are fundamentally sound and every all the effort you put in is rewarded. If you stop early, you have to go back to just doing technique. Yeah. And uh, the problem with techniques, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? You just want to load that technique to that patient and, and, you know, uh, it didn't work. And then, unfortunately, in MSK medicine, too many practitioners will put it back on the patient as if 
you know, it's, it's their fault. And the reality is you didn't do your due diligence as a doctor. And uh, I'm sure you've had case studies in your area of I, in mine where we just shake our heads and just think to ourselves, like, you know what, the, this is artists, different artists put different uh, stock in their craft, you know, and not all of us with the same degree, you know, have the same results or same experiences or same training. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, good case study. You got something that just stands out for you from the years of teaching ID or, or, or doing these things or something that really rings a bell. That's uh, kind of one of your moment that you're, you're most proud of as a provider. Boy, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and it's hard to narrow it down because I do, like, as I said, about 10 hours of coaching a week and almost daily where identifying things and fixing things that otherwise would have been missed. So a more recent one is we had a patient who a, a provider in California had a patient who turns out she had breast cancer and the MD missed it. The Cairo was missing it saw this ID provider who also happens to be a Cairo. And he was like, this doesn't make sense. And he brought it up in a coaching call. And within the first four questions of the history, I was like, whoa, we got a female 30 year, 30 year smoker. Her ranges are good. Um, And we walked through it. So I'm very proud that saved that person's life. That MD later told that doc, he's like, thank you so much for saving my life. The patient said that. So diagnostically and patient management wise, that's a huge win. As far as doing what our scope of practice is really well, um, boy, you know, uh, nothing stands out. They're all just I look at it as I'm doing my job, whether you get complete resolution or whether you get 50 percent better. But I need to bring you as far as conservative care can. So whatever your symptom change is. As long as I've maximized that, you understand your diagnosis, you're motivated to get the care you need and or load manage appropriately, then that's a stunning success. Um, have you had to change or modify the system over years? Uh, I know, um, you know, with some of the, the things that I've learned uh, over time, um, you know, uh, my approach has changed based off where the research has gone and my skill set and kind of where I'm at in the evolution of my practice. Is the system changed and what changes have occurred over the years? Great question. And I love this question because if you're not changing, you're not making progress. And the pace of change in ID is fast. We are constantly updating the protocols. We're constantly updating the diagnostic process. I do a webinar every month with new material. So what we've done, there's a couple of things that we're constantly doing. About two or three years ago, we introduced the idea that you have to measure every single test you do. There's core functional things that you have to measure, like dorsiflexion, straight leg raise, shoulder abduction, for example. We instituted this rule in a reliable way to measure these tests and then assigned a percent function to it. Because to a regular person to say you get a 45 degree straight leg raise doesn't mean anything. But to say you've got 50% of your range, that's a failing grade, resonates better. So we've improved our tests, our treatments, and our communication, our processes. As instructors in ID, we've improved our own skill at instruction. So we are constantly changing. Some people almost start to complain that, hey, wait, I just learned that. And now you've made it obsolete by adding this. Economists call it creative destruction. You have to destroy something in order to put something else in its place that's better. And I am 100% comfortable doing that. If someone else showed me a better system than this, I'd go take their class. So I am all for the result. And I plan on constantly changing the system as I have been. Um, what's the future looking like for you guys? And what's, what's the next five years, next 10 years looking for you and, and looking for the ID system? What's, what's the future like? So the future for the ID provider is we are providing tremendous value to have an accurate diagnosis, to apply manual therapy, exercise and advice appropriately we match reality as close as you can. This isn't a figment of the provider's imagination or the provider's wants and desires or the provider's training. 
it's as closely matched to reality as you can get. What that does for the patient is provide tremendous value. And then the provider, this is one of my goals with the system, is patients get what they deserve. I'm sorry, patients get what they need. Providers get what they deserve. So if you're providing tremendous value, you should be rewarded. And that's what we're doing. I have a lot of providers that have completely dropped insurance, gone all cash, and the top end ID providers are now doing a case fee, which has gotten a really bad rap from all these people that abuse it. They're like, come on in. I want $5,000. Here's 20 visits of decompression therapy. We look at it and we respect this tremendously. I, I never want to make a dollar more than I deserve or a dollar less. I just want this to be reality matched. And I, this is part of the core ethos of ID. What the case fee does is it gets the provider to be rewarded for excellence. If I can fix you in three visits and someone else didn't in 60 visits, why are they making more money than me? So this aligns, this rewards clinical excellence. Number two, the case fee provides pricing transparency. Very few places in the United States can you go and know what your ultimate cost is going to be until months later. We tell you up front. And then it encourages proper utilization for the patient. If you pay a lump sum up front, you're not going to be that patient. And this happens to everybody, right? Patient starts getting 70, 80% better and they think, see you later, doc, I don't need you. And this happens in not just musculoskeletal care, diabetes care, all kinds of things, heart care. So the case fee gets you to align the patient's interest. They're no longer having to decide every single visit, is this worth 80 bucks? They've already paid, now they're crazy not to finish care. So it encourages them to complete care, which makes a healthier patient. Instead of that, get to 70%, drop out, three months later, come back, drop out. Ultimately, that's more expensive. So the future for us is provide tremendous value, reap those rewards from the patient side, but also economically, time-wise, and just happiness-wise. When you're treating people that want care, that are paying for care, they're just a higher quality person to then do business with. They're not canceling the appointments. They're generally less upset. Um, so that's the future for our guys. And one more layer to that, we're looking at doing larger clinics with body part or body region specialists. One of the things we're changing to your prior question is that the human body is really complicated and orthopedists know this, right? They'll have the guy that does the hip and the guy that does the shoulder. Well, why don't we? If you're really going to be good at this, you got to drill down to a level of detail that's really hard to learn the whole body. So we've got a bunch of guys now that are doing that, but they're all rock stars. So you can't have revolution without wide acceptance. So we're looking at how can we get wider acceptance with these principles because they are complicated, because there's a long learning curve. Hey, let's focus more. You can be the hip and low back doctor. Someone else can be the upper extremity doctor. Someone else can be the cervical and thoracic spine all in one clinic so that you can refer back and forth when necessary. But I think there's tremendous power in that. It's better for the provider because you have focus and focus produces results. Uh, so that's some of the high end stuff that we are implementing. And I think that's the future. If you want to have excellence, you can't boil the ocean, so to speak. You got to focus. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, uh, interesting to hear about the evidence-based provider and uh, case fees because we usually think of the that rogue section of the of the chiropractic amount or the classic chiropractor where they would charge case fees for uh, care that was tough to justify. Uh, I'm being polite. Um, tough, tough to justify and. Uh, you know, it comes to the evidence based. We're so used to working on a fee for service model, but why don't the upper echelon people that are getting outstanding results that are actually saving people money? Why haven't we ventured into the the case fee? I mean, better patient commitment if they're invested in care, um, a better chance at outstanding saving an outstanding outcome. And if we are char charging for our expertise rather than the service. Yes. Uh, other providers of other professions do it. Attorneys. Um, I heard your attorney example, one of the videos. 
uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, engineers. Um, there's a, a running joke where, you know, guy w- walked into a warehouse and he was the eighth engineer and they asked him to fix something and uh, they paid the engineers and it wasn't fixed. He walked in, flipped one button, said $40,000 check and was out in five minutes. They're like, what for? You were here five minutes. And he says, one minute for me to figure out what the problem was, three minutes for me to walk over there and flip the switch, two minutes for you for, for me to walk back to your office and cut the check and walk out the door. Yep. I can send you a bill later, right? And if you are that guy obtaining outstanding clinical results, we've kind of – the evidence-based providers getting exceptional outcome have kind of uh, not – value truly value what we've done you know, in some cases life-changing results you caught a lady that had breast cancer that's life-changing yep. right right um you know and you may not provided treatment for that but there was definite value conferred in that visit i don't understand why we haven't started thinking of ourselves in that light you know and that's and here's the thing and i completely agree right the system right now punishes clinical excellence Fewer visits. Clinical mediocrity will always be more visits than clinical excellence. You're a tier one provider. You don't have to submit a clinical submission, (laughs) right? Well, thank you. Can I get $10 more? Can I get $10 to $15 more a visit? No, you're only going to get $60 for whatever you do. Right, right. It's disrespectful to your skill set. And insurance is destroying healthcare quality because if there's no incentive to be excellent, you won't provide excellence. That's how the system works. Individuals still will, but not for long. There's a huge drain in healthcare where the smart people are going into banking and other things. I've got friends that are nurse practitioners, emergency room physicians. These aren't the people at the country club on the weekend anymore. They were 20 no. years ago. So system-wise, we got a lot of things to fix, and I think Case Feed does it for us. It just says, hey, you've got a problem. I have a solution. And in most instances, you're paid more for a faster solution, not less. So we do have people, and this is part of what we train. If someone goes, well, geez, doc, what if you fix me in three visits? Wouldn't that be great for everybody? When, when? You're not paying me for visits. You're paying me for results. And I think the system could adopt that if we used objective measurements. So if I were an insurance company, I'd have independent people that measure the tests, the ranges, the blood pressure, like I talked about, and then the doc who fixes it. And you'd get paid based on how much better it is. That's just paying for performance. It's hard to capture, but it's a whole nother conversation, too. <laughs> yeah, our system our system uh, got twisted somewhere along the line. So. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm fresh out of questions, doc. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Um, I hope for the people that are, uh, that are watching this, they get some of the answers to the, uh, to the question. Uh, one little tidbit, um, if people need to get hold of you, what's the best way to get hold of you, um, to take this conversation further if they have things that weren't, were unanswered? Yes. So if you have questions for me, you can email contact at integrativediagnosis.com. I am on Facebook, Integrative Diagnosis. You can look that up and send a message, or you can use my personal Facebook, William Brady. And I'm happy to answer messages and discuss this. I want to thank you for actually taking me up on my offer to have a back and forth discussion about this. Um, and I appreciate your questions and your objectivity. Uh, it's It's been a pleasure, and I hope the people watching Thanks, uh, uh, benefit from it as well. So. Appreciate your time. And uh, if you don't know, Doc's Patriots are lined up for another Super Bowl run. He is smiling right now. Yes. Yes, indeed. So we'll see how that goes. All right. All right, Doc. Take care. Thank you.